Good morning. My name is Paulo Sotero. I'm the director here at the Brazil Institute at the Wilson Center. Uh, we do. We have a, a, a very interesting program, and we do things like this. By the way, just to put in context, this started meaning the uh, uh, presentation or the announcement public international announcement of this series of research uh, that Paulo Artacho coordinated on behalf of FAPESP started here, was launched here at the Wilson Center almost four years ago in October of 14. Uh, we had then uh, the Secretary of Energy of the United States, Ernie Moniz. We had uh, obviously representatives of FAPESP and other institutions, universities, because this is obviously a very uh, important uh, research effort. Uh, many actors in Brazil participated. I will leave to the chief scientist of the effort to explain this. Uh, for us, uh, the Brazil Institute is an honor, it's a pleasure to have you all here. Um, this is not our first initiative with FAPESP. We have start. We started in 2011 uh, a series of annual symposia uh, with them at their request uh, to facilitate exchanges on the presentation of exchanges on collaborative research. Uh, we do research on public policy here, but uh, we don't do research on, on, on science. We help those who have that mission to present in settings like this. And this is what the FAPESP weeks are. They started here in April of 2011 with a very two-day meetings and uh, where you highlight collaborative efforts of research by Brazilian and American uh, scientists uh, supported by different institutions, being in the Brazilian case, supported by FAPESP, which is a unique institution in Brazil. Uh, very successful, very well liked by the community, the scientific community in Brazil and others. Uh, we have been with FAPESP to MIT, uh, Ohio State, Michigan, uh, in the United States, in smaller states like uh, West Virginia. We have done uh, a series. You go to FAPESP site and you go to FAPESP week and you see there not only the different uh, for past weeks, but also the participants, also a summary of their presentations. So it's all public, all on the record, and we are going to be do uh, two more uh, this year in November after the week after Thanksgiving. There is a team from FAPESP or FAPESP supported scientists and scholars coming to New York to present on a variety of themes with the City University of New York. Uh, and we are start planning already a FAPESP week, probably next spring here in Washington, uh, where uh, the focus will be collaboration with George Washington University. Uh, this is, we are still building. I was just in Sao Paulo talking to the leaders of FAPESP there on this. So this is what we do. We are very glad that Paulo Artacho and other scientists were able to come here to present this. A uh, similar version of this was presented in Manaus just uh, two months ago. It was a very interesting, uh, successful, uh, I believe, uh, initiative. Uh, we featured there a very important thing, not always remembered, but Paulo Artacho made a point in having uh, the armed forces of Brazil participating as uh, uh, guests and in the opening ceremony because 
the, the armed forces, especially the army in the Amazon, has support, provided a lot of logistical support for scientific uh, missions that visit the Amazon. So this is a, 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 a very positive development. Uh, with that, I would like to call Paulo to uh, come here and officially, you know, give his part of this effort, this collaboration, and then we go for, I think we have also Rita Mesquita, and we have a welcome video by our dear Tom Lovejoy, and then we go from there. Paulo. Hello, uh, good morning for everybody. This, of course, you learned that it's a very informal uh, meeting, you know, as much informal, I think, the best uh, to exchange idea. And initially, you know, th this kind of uh, uh, activities from FAPESP uh, was born just to, to show what FAPESP have been doing for Amazonian research over the last 25, 30 years, and is actually a lot. So basically, FAPESP funds a lot of large projects, not just Go Amazon, LBA, ATO, or many, many projects that you heard about the, uh, along this year, but also supports initiatives for sustainable development of Amazonia. That's absolutely critical, not just for Brazil, but also, you know, everywhere for the planet. So basically, this is a critical and a top priority uh, uh, team of research in Amazonia. And I think uh, we are here to show some of these results that we're doing uh, in Brazil and also from, from NASA, for instance, in partnership with the Brazilian scientists, because this is a very, very international activity, as you learn very soon. So basically, you, you, you don't do that just uh, with the Brazilians or only uh, in Amazonian uh, people. Actually, it's a very collaborative international initiative, like in the Go Amazon, for instance. We had the 350 people in the field, you know, mostly funded here by DOE, but also from other countries. So this is the kind of science that FAPESP likes to see and will continue in funding. And we are here just to show to you some of the important results we got over the last uh, years. So basically, this is a very inf informal. So I think you enjoy uh, this day with this uh, nice discussion, a strategic discussion over uh, Amazonia. Thank you. And I uh, just wanted to, obviously, the role of FAPESP is central to all of this. Uh, we are doing also, there is an environmental change and security program of this Wilson Center. It's a partner in this. Very important, the Al Alcoa Foundation uh, that has uh, supported this initiative, uh, 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 providing uh, some, some uh, 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 funds that we could uh, travel and uh, uh, do the catering parts, et cetera, and highlight their role also. We'll have uh, a speaker later in the day from uh, the foundation, as we had in Manaus. Well, with that, I would like to invite, do we go for the video now? Or we go video now? Yes, how do you? So. Lara will do the magic. This is a message from Tom Lovejoy, obviously has worked for more than 50 years there. I'm really sorry that it's not possible for me to participate in this seminar personally, uh, but I'm delighted that so many distinguished scientists uh, are participating. The research of Pate uh, is of really great importance, and it derives from the research of Aeneas Galati in the 1970s, uh, which demonstrated without a doubt uh, that there was a hydrologic cycle in the Amazon that actually enables it to make half of its own rain. Today, that cycle uh, is experiencing the negative synergy uh, of deforestation, extensive use of fire, uh, and climate change. And Carlos Membre and I believe that there is a risk of tipping point uh, in the 20% deforestation region. 
and obviously it makes no sense to find out where the tipping point is by actually tipping it. We also know today, because of the LDA research, the extensive LDA research, uh, that there is a complex of interactions between the forest and the atmosphere uh, above it in the Amazon. Uh, and we also know that we need more science to really understand the pathway to sustainability. The, the phosphate project uh, is a central element uh, in this essentially menu of congratulations to everybody. Uh, I really look forward to the results of this seminar. Well, I'd like to invite then uh, Rita Mesquita to come to uh, the podium, make her introduction. She's a senior researcher at INPA, the National Institute for Amazon Research. Good morning. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, also, I think it's uh, very important uh, that we establish and strengthen our connections to everybody and anyone that is interested in discussing uh, alternative ways to, um, to deal with the Amazon. I think it's extremely important that we put the Amazon into this global context, but coming from a local institution based there, I say that we also have to be discussing uh, the local challenges there. So I'm very happy with the subject, the dimensions, scientific, social, and economic. So I hope that during my presentation, I can show you a little bit of uh, what my institution, it's a federal uh, institution in the Amazon, is doing to uh, face some of these challenges. Also, I think it's, uh, uh, it's very important for us to be uh, like a host institution for so many uh, initiatives that come and uh, come to study, come to contribute, come to interact. More than ever, we know that uh, the solution is going to be necessarily uh, interdisciplinary and it's going to have to come from uh, we putting together uh, all the different interests and all the different uh, objectives, which is extremely hard because. Uh, we, sometimes we deal a lot with modeling of ecological systems. But when it comes to modeling social and economic, uh, not always these models talk to each other. And we have to understand the feedback loops of each model because right now, personally, and I'm gonna be talking to you more about that in the afternoon, I think this is one of our biggest challenges is how to make the feedbacks of different models converse with each other so that we have um, advance in, uh, in the knowledge. So uh, thank you very much, and I hope we have a productive, enjoyable day here discussing the Amazon. Thank you. Uh, just to highlight one final thing, obviously it was IMPA that hosted us in Manaus in her beautiful Bosque da Ciencia. It was, a, I think, a very gratifying experience. and. Uh, so with that, I think we can invite Professor Paulo Artacho uh, back to the podium. We have the bios here, and uh, I will let you read them. But I can assure you they already forgot more about the Amazon than we, I will ever learn. So <laughs> these are some of the top scholars, scientists on Amazon research in the world, and I hope that you will benefit from this presentation. They got it. Okay, uh, good morning to everybody. So basically, we divide all the presentations to show different aspects modeling, remote sensing, in-situ measurements, integrative science of what we are doing uh, in Amazonia. So basically, uh, but all of them, you know, is based on one single aspect, you know, that the Amazonia is really a very unique uh, region, has a particular process and issues that we don't find in any other 
including tropical forests in the world. I hope this will be uh, clear in the end of the presentation. And the integration of the hydrological cycle, the carbon balance, and the socioeconomical issues is absolutely critical for the sustainability of Amazonia. And I hope this will be clear after all this scientific presentation. And also, it's important to say that Amazonia is a key component of the Earth system. So where Amazonia is going to is absolutely critical on how the whole planet is going to. So I hope this will be a critical message in the end. So basically, uh, you all know Amazonia, of course I know that, but let me just highlight uh, a few aspects of the Amazonia ecosystem. So basically, 15% of the global net primary productivity uh, and a key carbon sink sits uh, in Amazonia. So that's not a small amount of carbon, it's a huge amount of carbon. And if a small uh, percentage of this carbon is mobilized to the atmosphere or into the ecosystem, it can help uh, a lot to alleviate the global climate issue. We have in between 100 to 200 billion tons of carbon uh, into the biomass. This is about 10 times uh, every year emission in terms of uh, fossil fuel. So it's a lot of carbon storage in the ecosystem. The hydrological cycle in Amazonia is extremely strong, so we will discuss a lot of issues associated with the hydrological cycle. The Amazon River's discharge, of course, is the largest in the world and is the most intense hydrological basin in the, in the overall uh, uh, planet. The biodiversity is also, of course, linked to the climatic effects that we will focus, but never forget about the biodiversity. It's extremely important and is the uh, uh, region where you find most uh, uh, species per hectare in the whole world. And then uh, the annual rainfall in some of the uh, in some of parts of Amazon is 2.5 meters, so it's a huge amount of water and source of water vapor to the global atmosphere that sustain uh, the hydrological cycle, not just in Amazonia but also uh, outside Amazonia. And then also there are uh, at least. Uh, 300 indigenous population, a very large language diversity, and that also integrates all this into a common framework of socioeconomic and environmental issues. So how Amazonia works in the, uh, as a natural system? So basically, it's important to consider that Amazonia emits to the atmosphere, the forest itself, uh, trace gases, uh, aerosols, water vapor, and control the radiation balance through control of the uh, ob surface albedo. So basically what we see is that the ingredients that makes the climate over Amazonia is actually controlled by the vegetation itself. Several key processes in the vegetation controls the climate over Amazonia, including cloud formation, precipitation, and radiation balance, as this will be very clear from the presentations. And then, one aspect is that this natural system is changing. We cannot ignore that, and we need to study how this change will impact uh, the ecosystem and how this change will impact in, into the planet. Several presentations will address uh, this issue. So we recognize that, and a few years ago, we published a review paper in Nature showing uh, how uh, this transition from a natural system to a perturbed for a tropical forest season is going on. So basically, the major drives are agricultural expansion, are logging, and also global climate change that is hitting hard the Amazonia, as you're going to see very soon. And basically, this changes a lot of different processes that are the green boxes here. And then this has uh, important impacts like the increase in floodings, increase in, in, in dry season, and many different impact, uh, changes in the impact in the carbon cycle and the hydrological cycle of, of Amazonia. So this paper will try to describe how this transition is going and which are the dangers in terms of the ecosystem from this transition. Uh, 
the agricultural expansion uh, in Amazonia is, is basically due with deforestation and also uh, due with the biomass burning. So the smoke from biomass burning has very important impacts on the ecosystem, on the people who live in Amazonia, and on the primary productivity of the forest itself. So also the biomass burning issue is linked to deforestation and is linked to this transition from the natural to the uh, perturbed ecosystem we are observing. And this uh, transition is characterized by uh, deforestation, by fire, by selective logging, uh, that's mostly in Pará, and different regions of Amazonia are uh, impacted by different aspects. So it's not a unique, uh, uh, homogeneous uh, uh, picture that is changing in Amazonia, but what's happening in Pará Acre and Mato Grosso is very much different from what happens in Amazonia, in Amazonas state, and so on. So basically, if you look here, we see that Amazonia, you can look into Amazonia as a very uh, complex, non-linear system, where the biology of the forest here uh, change the atmospheric chemistry, change the physics of the climate over Amazonia, and this links uh, in LBA, we are trying to find out all the links and the interrelationship between the biological functioning of the forest with the chemistry of the atmosphere and with the physics of the climate that controls precipitation and radiation balance in a very, very unique way. Uh, sometimes it's absolutely impossible to separate where the biology is different from the chemistry, from the physics of the atmosphere. So basically we are uh, contributing to understand this process that are absolutely critical for uh, sustainable development of Amazon in terms of public policies. And Amazon is also changing a lot from the governmental point of view. So this map here from IPAN from the beginning of the 90s shows uh, the amount of protected areas in Amazonia, and you see down here the amount of protected areas in 2013. It's a huge increase by 90% of the protected areas in Amazonia, and this is paying a lot of efforts into conservation of Amazonia, but of course we still have to do much more to really protect this protected area that sometimes the Brazil government is not being able able to do that, you know? But anyway, uh, right now, we have 125 million hectares of protected land uh, in Amazonia, and that's a huge advance over just uh, uh, 20 years ago. So basically, Amazonia, also from the governmental point of view, is an area that is suffering a lot of different changes. But on the other side, if you look to the IBGE, the Brazilian, a statistical, a statistical uh, office, you see that Amazonia, that is the uh, poverty map, and you see that Amazonia state has uh, the, the number of persons in, in situation of really uh, extreme poverty is more than 80 to 90 percent. So basically, we also have to take into account the socioeconomic uh, issues and give a proper life to 20 million of Brazilians that live in Amazonia, and we are very far from uh, giving that. So, and then Amazonia is not isolated from the rest of the world. It does not make sense if you protect only Amazonia and forget about all the different tropical forests. And basically, this is a recent paper, May 2018 in Science, showed that one third of global protected land is under uh, intense human pressure. So this is not a process that are not happening in Amazonia, and we need uh, certainly a global effect to preserve tropical uh, rainforest, not just in Amazonia, but in Indonesia, in Africa, and many other uh, regions. And Amazonia, uh, what the main process, if I would name it just one single process that is critical for Amazonia, is very simple, is photosynthesis. As you're gonna see, several of the presentations today will address the issue of the carbon cycle and the radiation balance. 
so basically, no, normally I put a stomata here because when you see the forest, you don't see these stomata, but they are the critical ingredients where radiation meets life in Amazonia. And several of the process we are going to discuss here is related to the physiological functioning of the forest itself. And this is important because this is the global map of net primary productivity uh, in terms of grams of carbon per square meter per year that's absorbed by, uh, by the ecosystem. And you see why Amazonia and South America in particular is important. So it's the hot spot in the whole world in terms of carbon cycling. So this is not to be neglected, so this is critically important where we have to find all possible ways to reduce the atmospheric CO2 concentrations. And Amazonia, until a few years ago, uh, was absorbing carbon from the atmosphere uh, up to about 0.5 to 0.7 tons of carbon per hectare per year. But what we are observing is that um, in the last 10 years, Actually, this, the carbon allocation to the ecosystem continues to work, but we are observing a very large increase in tree mortality, uh, possibly because of uh, the extreme droughts of 2005 and 2010 that many uh, presentations will discuss. And then what's happened is that Amazonia, that was absorbing carbon from the ecosystem over the last three, four years, the net carbon flux is about zero. So a very important ecosystem service that Amazonia was doing for the global climate actually now basically is carbon neutral, and that is absolutely important for controlling the atmospheric CO2 uh, concentration. And that happens mostly because of the increase in uh, tree mortality. Another, another important aspect of Amazonia, uh, Amazonia is on this planet, and this planet is heating up. So basically, on the left, you see uh, the temperature anomalies, and on the right, precipitation anomalies. So you see that we are observing increase in temperature in Amazonia in between 1.5 to 2 degrees. Depends on how you count this, where you find. But anyway, Amazonia is heating up, and this has uh, important consequences for the ecosystem functioning. And on, on the right side, is the anomaly in the precipitation. So basically, several areas of Amazonia is suffering decrease in precipitation. And for a tropical rainforest, this is absolutely uh, important. So actually, we need to study better what are the drivers. Are these coming? Uh, it's just a seasonal cycle. Maring will probably address some of this issue. Or this is caused by climate change, or it's just will come back in a few years, we actually, it's an important uh, research aspect. And the forecast for the future is not very uh, brilliant. So on the, on the left, there are impi uh, estimation of the increase in temperature. So you see that the eastern part of Amazonia could, in, in, in certain scenarios, heat up by 7 to 8 degrees. So this will have a huge effect on the ecosystem functioning, and we have to prevent that as much as possible happening. And on the right is the change in precipitation, and the forecast for this particular simulation is a reduction in precipitation of about 25 to 30 percent. That's a huge impact over over a tropical rainforest. So this is uh, critical issues that we also uh, have to address in, in a lot of details. And very recently also a paper on, on science advances shows that the climate model, in addition to, this, uh, to the slow increase in temperature and the slow decrease in precipitation, also shows that the increase in the extremes is also going up. And Amazonia, you, you see that, is very sensitive to the extremes in climate. Not just Amazonia, but overall. But you see that Amazonia is a very hot spot in terms of increasing in climate variability. So this is uh, another aspect that you have to take into account. 
Carlos Nobre have shown in several different papers that uh, there is a possibility that part of the uh, western, eastern part of Amazonia with, with these aspects of climate change could not sustain anymore uh, the forest. And you see here several simulations with the fires, with the um, uh, increasing atmospheric CO2, how the forest could shrink significantly, release lots of carbon uh, to the global atmosphere. And basically, if you take in account the effects of fires, the effects of climate change, in some of the different scenarios by 2050, that's just 30 years from now, we could have a very significant uh, reduction in forest cover. So actually we are in a transition of a very important period where what we're doing on this particular decade can be critical for the future of Amazonia in only 30 or 40 years. We're not discussing for next century. And the model estimate shows this uh, very, very clear. So basically, the, the biggest question is, Amazonia is on the left side right now, is on a certain equilibrium state, but it's possible that we are going to two different transitions. A transition where uh, savannas in the east and southeast take part of the forest ecosystem, and or on the right, where a large deforestation in Amazonia or a large loss of forest can happen, and then we transform it uh, parts of Amazonia in another equilibrium state that can have a very important impact uh, for the global climate. So what are the thresholds for this to happen? That's a very big question. There are a lot of discussion here. You see four different papers. But basically, uh, the threshold for this tipping point is estimated according to a paper from Carlos recently, it's about 40% of the total deforested area. Now we are in about 19 to 20%, and an increase in temperature of about 4 degrees. Right now we are having an increase in temperature of about 1.5 to 2 degrees. So we are not far away. So that is the, uh, a key message in terms of climate change impacts uh, in Amazonia. We'll, you will see discussion here quite a lot on the atmospheric effects of deforestation, atmospheric properties of trace gases, aerosols, and where precipitation happens. But let's not forget that Amazonia also has another part that is under the soil. So basically, soil process controls a lot of different uh, properties of the Amazonian ecosystem. And in particular, the forests have developed a very smart uh, strategies on getting water during the dry season up to a, a depth of 10 meters uh, deep into the soil. So the forest itself developed a mechanism to deal with this uh, drought impact, but to a certain limit, of course. You know, where are the limits? We need the very good science to find out where we are for, have, for taking care of not going above these uh, limits in terms of forest. And then uh, the hydrological cycle is absolutely critical for Amazonia, as we all know. And the clouds in Amazonia are completely different from the natural clouds, as we see here, and from the clouds formed by biomass burning. That's a very uh, important aspect of the Amazonian transformation into a new area. And basically, the clouds are very much dependent on the amount of aerosols, par aerosol particles that are very, very, very small particles. Uh, 10 nanometers to 100 nanometers. And these particles are the cloud nucleation particles that helps to form clouds in Amazonia. And without clouds, you don't have precipitation. So this is a process that we, FAPESP put a lot of, of uh, efforts into try to unveil this mechanism to improve the climate models, to improve the, our understanding of the impact of biomass burning on the ecosystem. And it's always important to remember that Amazonia is critical for the hydrological cycle, not just over Amazonia, because the water vapor that is produced over the tropical uh, Atlantic is processed into Amazonia. Amazonia does not produce water vapor per itself. It's just processed water vapor. And this water vapor goes down to north of Argentina and southern part of Peru, including 
uh, Mato Grosso and Goiás, that were we produced most of the grains in South America. So, preservation of Amazonia is critical for the agribusiness in Brazil, Argentina, and the countries uh, downwind of Amazonia. And the hydrological cycle in, in Amazonia is changing, and is changing uh, in a very dramatic way. Uh, this is a paper published by Manuel Glor that shows the Amazon River discharge at Obidos, that's close to the mouth of Amazonia, uh, is increasing in the last 30 years. So basically, what we are observing is an increase, an intensification of the hydrological cycle for both the wet season in green and also the dry season in blue. So basically, why this is happening is not very clear. One possible uh, driver is the tropical Atlantic sea surface temperature. Uh, if you have uh, um, uh, two degrees warmer tropical Atlantic, you have more evaporation, and this, in theory, brings more uh, water vapor into the Amazon, and this water vapor returns into the Amazon mouse. As a possibility, but there are a lot of issues behind all this very complex pro process that we are studying. But basically, you are seeing an increase in the, in the flow of uh, water in the mouth of Amazonia by 30% over the last 30 years. And that's a very significant uh, change. In addition to this change in the, in the regular uh, discharge, we also see a change in the extremes in Amazonia. So this is a study for Yoshin Shongard from IMPA that shows clearly that the amplitude between the uh, fluids and the droughts is increasing very clearly. So in some sense, we are also increasing significantly the extremes in the hydrological cycle in Amazonia, and this is very uh, well documented. And actually, a paper published yesterday, I was making a revision on this issue. Also, it's called the recent intensification of Amazonian flooding extremely driven by strengthened walker circulation. Shows that uh, large scale circulations is also contributing to the uh, increase in this uh, flooding extremes into Amazonia, uh, increasing the convergence of water vapor over this region. This could be driven by climate change or could be a natural system, na natural phenomena, uh, we don't know, but basically this is just a diagnostic that the large scale process have important impact over the functioning of the Amazonia ecosystem. And you see that the flood duration and the drought duration increases as we came closer to uh, recent dates. Uh, they have done an analysis of more than from the more than 120 years in this particular uh, paper. So basically what we are seeing is that the Amazonian climate system has been oscillating between two extremes over the last uh, 13 years, strong droughts and strong floods that was not happening like that, uh, let's say, 20 or 30 years before today. So something is happening. Uh, we are far to have a, a complete diagnostics. And independent measurements is always very important. So these are measurements from the NASA uh, GRACE satellite that also shows that over Amazonia, uh, we are seeing a uh, two centimeter per year increase in precipitation. This is done uh, measuring gravity over Amazonia. If you have more water, you increase the gravity attraction. So basically, independent measurements also are showing that, oh, oh something is happening, intensifying the hydrological cycle uh, over Amazonia uh, with measurements from space. Another uh, very well documented changes in Amazonia is that the dry season length is increasing uh, in Amazonia. So basically, we see that over the last 30 or 40 years, the dry season uh, is starting earlier and is finishing later over the year. So this increase in the dry season uh, increases forest fires that also make big changes in the hydrological cycle, feedbacking on the uh, um, 
on the hydrological cycle. And basically, the dry season length has increased by six days, six days per decade. So over 30, 40, or 50 years, this will make a huge change in the dry season. And some plant species are very sensitive to the length of the dry season. So also, this will certainly affect the biodiversity of the forest. And this is a movie that uh, shows uh, basically how uh, uh, the water vapor from Amazonia uh, is, can, can you get me another pointer? Because this is, is you see, is not working properly. But OK. Yeah, OK, doesn't matter. But you see that the, all, all the water vapor that feeds the precipitation all over the world came from tropical regions either from Amazonia, from the tropical Pacific. You can see that very clear. So any changes in the water vapor fluxes from this region is critical for the precipitation everywhere, not just in Amazonia, because we have a linked uh, hydrological cycle uh, all over the world. So basically, it's an important concept that what's happening in Amazonia will certainly affect the global uh, climate. And Brazil have a very big success in reducing deforestation. Uh, we reduced the deforestation from 27,000 square kilometer to 4,000 square kilometer, as you see here. Uh, that was done through implementing public policies that reduce deforestation strongly. And that shows that it is possible to reduce deforestation even to zero. But as you can also see on this picture, over the last four or five years, because of the lack of governance in Brazil, basically we are seeing uh, deforestation getting back uh, again. And of course, uh, Brazil has commitment in the Paris Agreement to reduce it to zero illegal deforestation and to reforest 12 million uh, hectares in Brazil. So basically, how we're going to fulfill our Paris Agreement commitments with increasing in uh, forest fires. And preliminary data from INPE shows that uh, for 2018, this will be even higher, higher than 8,000 square kilometers. So we are on the rise in terms of uh, deforestation. Also, we are on the rise in terms of forest fires. So this is the fire spots in Amazonia compiled by INPE. You see that in 2004, 2005, we had about 140,000 individual fires monitored over Brazil. But you see that from 2012 to 2017, we are approaching 120,000 fires again. So basically, all the success of reducing deforestation, reducing forest fires is actually coming back. And this is, of course, uh, an issue that is important. And this forest fire sends smoke to the atmosphere. And this smoke you can easily see by NASA satellites. You see that the smoke covers most of the South America area and has very, very important uh, impacts on the ecosystem, as you're going to see here. And these are some of the forest fires uh, that are driven uh, all the dry season in, in Amazonia. And you see the Andes here on the left, how the Andes is limiting the propagation of this smoke to the Pacific and channeling it to the southern part of Brazil. And this smoke is very important because to make a cloud, you need the three important ingredients. You need the water vapor, of course. You need an aerosol particle to act to cloud condensation nuclei, where this water vapor can condense over the surface of these particles. And you need the correct atmospheric thermodynamic conditions. Without any of these three ingredients, you don't have clouds. If you don't have aerosol particles in the atmosphere, we will never see any clouds uh, in the atmosphere. And actually, we are changing several of the properties of clouds in Amazonia that, of course, controls the uh, hydrological cycle. So, and in particular, convective clouds are very, very important in Amazonia, a tropical area with a lot of different convection. And you see that the uh, hot water from the North Atlantic feeds into the hydrological cycle in Amazonia in very, very uh, strong way. 
and the impact of the increasing aerosols in Amazonia can be easily seen in the precipitation in, this, in the La Plata Basin. Uh, so this is a paper from Maria Assunção that shows that if you increase the aerosols in Alta Floresta, Gi Paraná, Rio Branco, several places in Amazonia, you basically decrease the rainfall rate in the La Plata Basin, in the uh, northern part of Argentina and southern part of, of Brazil, showing a direct link between biomass burning in Amazonia and the decrease of precipitation in areas where we produce most of the food in uh, Latin America. Uh, and the, the issue, if the deforestation uh, changes the, the, the mm. hydrological cycle, is still a very open question, because we, we cannot attribute this change directly to the deforestation rates. But a recent paper in, in shows that in Rondonia, the deforestation in Rondonia have changed already. Uh, we can measure this, you know, the precipitation downwind and upwind from the region. If you deforest the area, in addition to reduce evapotranspiration, you change actually the roughness, sickness, as we call, the turbulence of the wind, and this turbulence is critical for cloud formation and precipitation. And we are already observing this for the Rondonia uh, state. And then there is the effects of these aerosol particles on the carbon cycle. Carbon cycle, of course, is a critical ingredient uh, in Amazonia. And if you, increase, if you increase the amount of aerosols, you increase the diffuse radiation of Amazonia and decrease the direct radiation. And photosynthesis likes to be done with the diffuse radiation because of several different ecophysiological aspects. And then we show that for several of the LBA towers, if you increase the amount of aerosol, you increase the net uh, ecosystem exchange, that is amount of carbon being absorbed by the ecosystem. But to a certain point, if you increase the smoke too much, you reduce so much the total radiation flux that photosynthesis goes to zero in the middle of the day. So basically, you see how aerosols can control a lot the carbon allocation and the carbon uptake by the forest. So this is our critical process that we are uh, learning more and more. These are measurements on the LBA towers. And the same issue was confirmed by modeling, large scale modeling of the overall Amazonia, where if you increase the biomass burning emissions, you increase the net primary productivity of the forest because of the increase in diffuse radiation. So these aerosols change dramatically, not just the hydrological cycle, but also changes the uh, carbon allocation to the forest. Um, just to finish, just to show some uh, recent examples uh, of findings in Amazonia that I think is, is very important. So uh, we had a very, very successful cooperation with DOE from the US uh, through the Go Amazon uh, experiment, where you set up several aircraft and ground-based measurements over uh, two years in Amazonia that provide a unique snapshot of Amazonia. And in particular, we had an aircraft that can fly up, up to 14 kilometers high into the atmosphere and can go from Belém to Manaus to the northern part of, of uh, Brazil and to Alta Floresta uh, flying all over, making vertical profiles of atmospheric properties. And one of the critical questions we have in Amazonia is this is the size distribution of particles measured at the, at the Ato Tower as a function of the day. And you see that we don't see particles that are below 100 nanometers. So the particles that should uh, be present to populate the accumulation mode of the, partic of, of the particle are not produced down here into the forest, like it is in the boreal forest. So it's a very different uh, process from the boreal forest to the tropical forest. But then came the question, how particles are produced in Amazonia? So and then, when you got the hollow plane uh, flying 
over uh, 12 kilometers high in Amazonia, you see that the concentration of aerosol particles is below 300 particles per cc down up to three or four kilometers. But when you get to 12 kilometers, you, you find 20,000, 25,000 particles per cc. It's much higher concentration than downtown Sao Paulo. So what happens? How could they, these particles be produced up there in the, tropos, in the upper troposphere? And this was never observed in the US, in Europe, or any other place. So basically what happens is that the forest itself emits uh, semi-volatile compounds that goes up into the atmosphere, 14 kilometers, the temperature is minus 55 degrees centigrade. These gases condense into the particles. These particles uh, are processed, oxidized, and then clouds bring these particles down back here, repopulating the cloud condensation nuclei down here. So forest plus the clouds, are the source of these particles that are critical for the hydrological cycle in Amazonia. And I think this is a beautiful story on how the climate and the forest interact with itself to produce a fantastic uh, ecosystem like Amazonia. And when you have rain, the rain brings water down, but also brings particles from 14 kilometers down here to produce the new clouds, to produce the new rain. So basically, this is a nice story of the how the integrate uh, ecological process in Amazonia uh, works. And in terms of the future, uh, we just started recently, two years ago, the operation of a fantastic laboratory that atmospheric uh, atmospheric laboratory that's the Ato Tower, and the Ato Tower uh, is, is a laboratory in tropical regions, 325 meters tall tower, it's not very easy to go up there, but it's a fantastic laboratory that is open to any research in the world, including, of course, American research, and I think it's a unique opportunity to find a new findings a new discovery in Amazonia. And another challenge is uh, Brazil, to fulfill his uh, Paris Agreement uh, obligation. Uh, we have to do restoration of 12.5 million <coughs> hectares. And the question is, with which technology, which species, how are we going to do this? And this is absolutely critical to absorb a large uh, amount of um, carbon from the atmosphere and reduce the atmospheric CO2 concentration, of course, together with the reduction of fossil fuel uh, emission. Uh, and then, Amazonia is also critical to reach the Paris Agreement uh, commitments, and in particular, uh, the tipping points of the uh, new climate that we are designing in our planet, a critical issue of these tipping points could be in Amazonia. Because if a large fraction of, of the carbon stored in Amazonia goes to the atmosphere, CO2 concentration could go from where it is right now 404 uh, ppm to 800, 900 ppm, and then life will not be very easy in this uh, planet. But let me uh, just sh uh, show you this last slide that shows that uh, we are discussing here the food, land use, and the biosphere. But of course, the issues associated with the climate change are much broader than that. That inv is, involves urbanization, involves human capacity and demography, sustainable consumption and production. And I think we will help find the process in Amazonia uh, how, to to, how to build up a sustainable new uh, societal structure that we will have in the next uh, decades. So basically, I think that the message is that Amazonia is absolutely critical to uh, global sustainability. And I hope that the next uh, presentations will show this also uh, very clear. Thank you for the attention. Yeah, if you have any questions, uh, comments, uh, disagreements, um, <laughs> go ahead. Um, is, there any, is there any modeling of the impact of dam construction on the hydrological cycle in the Amazon? 
Yes, uh, there are. It's not my specialty, you know, but uh, researchers from IMPA, Philip Fernside, have done an estimate of the how much methane is being emitted by the dams, and it's uh, pretty significant. There are also studies on how the dams are changing the hydrological flow in a small basin. Of course, they are not changing yet the Amazonia uh, flow, but it, there are uh, important impacts in, in, in several basins. So actually, uh, and that is uh, making hugely difficult for Brazil to build a new hydroelectric power in Amazonia. As you can see, after the experience of Belo Monte, actually nobody even talk anymore about that, <laughs> fortunately. <laughs> How much of the fire problem is anthropogenic versus uh, natural from That's the very easy to answer, 100%. 100% of the fires are anthropogenic because of one single reason. It's terribly difficult to put fire on a tropical forest where it rains 3,000 millimeters per year. The, f the forest does not burn by itself. It's too much water. And actually, it's very difficult to burn the Amazon. What the people does, uh, probably Doug Morton is a big specialist on this. He will answer this question, complement the answer later. So you have to cut down the forest in May, basically. Let the forest dry until beginning of September. Because if you, put f if you put fire in the forest and the forest is not dry, it will burn, let's say, 50%. And if you have 100 tons of uh, wood per hectare, and if you just burn 50% of it, you is dead. You cannot do anything with that land. So you need to have a very efficient burning process to remove most of the carbon, most of the tree trunks, you know, from the place. So basically, the forest never we never saw any fire that could be caused by lightning because it rains a lot. Everything is completely wet, uh, even in the dry season. When the people say the dry season is more vulnerable, it rains a lot in the dry season also. You know, it rains less than the wet season. That's the reason why it's called the dry season. But the simple answer for our question is 100% of, of the fires are anthropogenic. Um, on the tipping points yep. uh, issue, you mentioned 20% deforestation and f no 40% deforest and four degrees C. Is that a, is there a synergy between those two variables? Obviously, so if you get to some combination of those two. Yes, yes. Of course, there is a strong synergy, and this is very nicely discussed in a Thomas Lovejoy and Carlos Nobre paper in Science three or four months ago. There is a synergy between these two variables, of course, but um, and Carlos Nobre have shown with the modeling that uh, yeah, the tipping point could be around the four degrees centigrade and 40% deforestation, you know? But uh, this is a very hot, debatable uh, question. Other scientists disagree completely over these tipping points. Some say it's much larger than that. Others say it's much more than that. Maybe Marengo can discuss that on his uh, presentation. I have a question about the key policy changes or enforcement mechanisms that uh, reduce deforestation yeah. so significantly. Oh yeah, it's, uh, it's possible to reduce the deforestation. The simple answer is yes. So, and it's easy and does not cost a lot of money. But of course it needs to have a political support from the Brazilian Congress. And that's where the problem starts, you know. In our Congress in Brazil, about 225 uh, members of parliament are actually associated with the, the agroeconomical issues in Amazonia. And actually what was happening, for instance, the, the funding for the Ibama Previ Fogo, you know, it's a unit of Ibana, Ibama dedicated to prevent forest fires. They were 400 people four years ago. Now there is less than 50, I guess, because all their funds were cut. Fiscalization is now is completely inexistent. 
you know? You needed to have the federal policy into the field. You needed to have the fire brigades into the field, well equipped. If you do that, you can easily reduce the deforestation to zero, and does not cost a lot of money. It's not a question of funds. It's a political issue, you know? So uh, a large fraction of the Congress wants Amazonia to be just a soybean plantation, you know, and so on. This really is the reality, you know? And there are another component of this that fights against the deforestation. And now, with the Paris Agreement, is an important uh, ob Brazilian obligation that will help us eventually to reduce even more the deforestation. But it's a, it's a constant fight between soybean and the cattle ranch people versus uh, the Brazilian government, part of the Brazilian government, and also the conservation people, you know? We will win this fight. Yeah? Uh, nice to see you, Professor uh, Paulo Hattacho, after so many years uh, from the LBA. LBA. Uh, you said that uh, the, uh, the Amazon forest shifted from sink to a neutral uh, state. And you said that tree mortality was uh, one of the causes, or mm -hmm. that's the cause you, s you said. So I was wondering what exactly is tree mortality, if it's something normal, that a forest, you know, part of the, 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 the forest ecosystem. And another question is, uh, you said, you also said that there will be a heat up from seven to eight degrees Celsius. Mm -hmm. And I would like to know what is the timeline on that? Is okay. 20, 50 years from now? Okay, the first question will be certainly addressed by Douglas Morton uh, presentation, you know. And the, the, the f um, uh, increase in temperature by the RCP 8.5 at the INPI simulation was done for 2100, so at the end of this century. But basically the effects will be seen much, much before that, you know. So, uh, we can expect that climate change will hit Amazonia very hard. I think there is no question about that. You know, all the measurements we are doing that, all the models we are doing that emphasize this. The question is how, how long it will take and how intense will be the effect in terms of carbon budget. So as you're gonna see, several people will address this issue and this is a very hot topic of research right now. Okay, thank you very much for the attention. Yeah, uh, let me let me recommend. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you very much. I understand that there is a great deal of natural regeneration also happening in parts of the Amazon and that the monitoring system doesn't quite capture this. Yes. So I'd really like to get your insights on where it might be happening why it might be happening, and uh, you know, any yeah. other thoughts you the might have. The dynamics of forest degradation and forest recuperation is extremely complex, you know. Uh, we understand actually very little from that. Douglas can disagree with me, but he will show some uh, measurements on that. This is being, and the monitoring of the forest degradation is a challenge using remote sensing and using uh, in the field measurements. But uh, uh, recent progress on that shows that forest degradation can be up to 60 to 70 percent of the total deforestation. You know, I have one slide from Celso Van Handen that will discuss exactly this topic. So basically, the answer is forest degradation, not uh, clear cut, can be 60 to 70 percent of the clear cut area. So this adds to 800, um, 8,000 square kilometer uh, per year of clear cut, at least 10 or 12 uh, square kilometer per year. That's a huge area of forest that is impacted by human activities. The yes. Yes, the regeneration also there, INP Jean Ometo is doing a lot of different calculations on how much biomass in abandoned forests, you know, can uh, regenerate. And it's pretty significant in the south of Pará, where most of the measurements are being done. And uh, the regeneration, uh, the forest after 30, 40 years, 
You know, data shows that the forest never reach 100% of the carbon allocation it had from the beginning, but it can reach 60 to 70% of the original uh, forest. But the biodiversity is very severely affected. So you never reach even 30% of the original biodiversity. And that's a big issue. Okay. Well, now let's move uh, without, uh, coffee is just outside if you want to grab a cup, but uh, I would like to invite Douglas Morton, Earth scientist at Na the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, who will uh, enlighten us on remote sensing of Amazon deforestation. Thank you very much. Um, Pablo, that's a fantastic introduction. I don't need to say a whole lot more on the uh, overall topic, the mechanisms, the cycles, uh, et cetera. I'm going to fill in a few specific details in this talk that will focus a little bit more on NASA's perspective on remote sensing. Um, although I have to say, at 325 meters above the forest on the top of the Atto Tower, that's kind of like remote sensing. I'm going to say that. Um, that's about the altitude we fly in our small airplanes as we're collecting data over the Amazon and other regions. And so as we sort of start to connect to the different scales of observation, I think it becomes ever more powerful linking up our ground measurements with what we're learning from aircraft campaigns as well as what our satellite data will tell us um, from an orbital position. Um, I've expanded the title of my talk to focus specifically about uh, Amazon deforestation and degradation. I will try to make a few comments about regeneration. Um, it's great to hear the discussion already started. And so what my goal is here today is to give you a little bit of an, um, a chance to catch up on where we are from the frontier of remote sensing and discussing such critical topics as land use change and its impact on the Amazon. And then to lay the foundation. Because, of course, satellite remote sensing alone is not the answer to our problems. Um, Brazil, in particular, has been a pioneer in using satellite data to capture the diversity of conditions across such a vast expanse like the Amazon. Um, but it does need the political will, as Paulo just mentioned, uh, to be able to carry forward not just those foundational measurements, but action on top of that. Um, before I go on, I'd love to just recognize uh, several of the folks from my team at NASA and down the road at the University of Maryland along with some collaborators that I work closely with on this research in Brazil at the U.S. Forest Service and JPL um, at Embrapa in Brazil, uh, as well as at IMPI. Um, and the list of folks that I've had the pleasure of working with includes the folks that will be participating today, uh, but also um, a wide range of folks from universities, from NGOs, from other Brazilian organizations over the last 20 years of my research in the Amazon. I'd also like to thank the Wilson Center, um, the organizer of this session, because this is a really critical time for this dialogue. Although there may be some considerable uncertainty about the trajectory of human activity in the Amazon, um, now is as good a time as any to organize our discussions and our thoughts under the auspices of the Paris Agreement, under some of the commitments in reforestation, and some of the economic um, discussions that are ultimately driving the dynamics of land use decisions at the Amazon frontier. So I'm going to focus on um, four things today. Uh, I'd like to give just a quick introduction for those of you that are not familiar with what NASA's role might be in terms of the research in this international group. Um, the research that we're doing is, um, is almost always international, and that's been recognized several times today. That carries forward in the research that NASA brings to the table and its long partnership on understanding the Amazon. I'd like to focus on the deforestation monitoring, which has been critically successful uh, based on the ability for us to use and distribute information. Um, the objective perspective of a satellite image provides a really nice platform for having our conversations about priorities. Um, I'd like to talk more about degradation. That's really the avenue that um, has been discussed several times already today, and I think will help us carry forward in terms of how do we think about managing and protecting um, landscapes that are defined by human activity um, and are more and more relevant as we think about the extent and the legacy of human actions at the Amazon forest frontier. Um, and because I do focus a lot of my research on science, I can't get away without talking about fire. So I'd like to close out the discussion with a little bit more context. How do we put the Amazon situation? Um, Paulo uh, already referenced the critical role that biomass burning can play in both um, fertilizing Amazon forests and preventing them from their typical functions in photosynthesis. And that delicate balance is something that's defined in large part by the Amazon, but not only by the Amazon. And so I'd like to broaden the perspective just a little bit on that theme. NASA has more than 20 uh, Earth observing platforms. And my job as an Amazon scientist, or a scientist that focuses on the Amazon using NASA data, 
is to be able to combine the different measurements we have of the Earth system. So many of these sensors are collecting data about clouds and the atmosphere. Some are collecting data about the land surface and the various components. Um, some of these measurements are made daily, and some of these measurements are only made every month. Um, and so stitching together those different pieces of the puzzle is part of what makes my job exciting, uh, part of what makes it a challenge, um, and all of it is grounded in our measurement and our understanding from the field perspective. So NASA's remote sensing data are all distributed freely and openly to the world. It's been the basis of our collaboration around issues like deforestation monitoring, and it's been the critical foundation that has allowed us to have a conversation not just in Brazil, but in the other parts of the world about how do we use the long time series of measurements from NASA to be able to track and then ultimately um, influence the direction of human activity, including uh, one of our more recent launches, which sits out at a Lagrange point a million miles from Earth and has a full disk view of the Earth every day. Um, we also just launched uh, ISAT-2, Despite its name, it actually will collect information about vegetation, um, and the work goes on. So there's an entire series of missions that are designed to capture different components of the Earth system. One of the things that um, I do want to make sure I start out with is the idea that this NASA cooperation on research in the Amazon started a long time ago with an international effort called LBA. Um, and a number of the scientific themes that you've already heard about today got their root in international partnerships with NASA support um, and Brazilian scientists working together to understand characteristics of the influence of drought on Amazon forest function, um, the dynamics of changing land use, the critical role that tropical forests play in absorbing carbon from the atmosphere, um, as well as understanding the drivers and the human actions that represent trajectories of both current and then potential future deforestation across the Amazon basin. And so this NASA partnership was really fundamental in getting, our, um, getting scientists including those of us that are presenting today, um, into the field, working internationally, and trying to tackle some of the big outstanding challenges. Um, and from the very beginning, uh, land use has been at this, the heart of our discussions because human activity across the Amazon frontier is an incredibly important driver of change. Land use and land use change, um, I think, comes into focus when I put up these three questions. So I could take satellite remote sensing data and use it to ask important questions of, where specific things are happening. Um, that's the kind of mapping activity we might do once a year or once every five years to understand what is the extent of forest cover or what was the last year's increment of deforestation. Um, but there's more that we can do than just mapping um, with our satellite remote sensing data. Several of our satellites have a coverage of the Amazon every day. And that allows us to track the daily progression of individual fires or of new deforestation activity, clouds and rainfall, et cetera. And that kind of monitoring is something that really came along about 20 years ago with the launch of these satellite systems that had essentially daily coverage of the entire planet. And that really was a watershed moment in our understanding of how regular and routine use of satellite data could be used to track everything from new deforestation to crop productivity um, and, and other phenomena. And then the last part here is really a question of can we combine all of the different measurements we have to understand why activities are happening? So for example, in the case of deforestation, we might use our daily coverage from satellite data to identify the new area of land conversion at the edge of the forest frontier. And then we might follow that up over the next three to six months to see, was that area used for cattle pasture? Or was that area used to plant row crops like rice or soybeans? And so we can actually get an insight into what was the motivation behind that new deforestation event by following up on the fate of that clearing over time using satellite data. Certainly, we don't understand the precise motivation or economic incentives at the level of the individual farmer, but we have some very clear observational evidence for the likely driver of that change. So that's been a really important um, and, and really been part of the longstanding collaboration between NASA and IMPI in particular, where satellite data have been shared. Uh, scientists have, like myself have worked closely with collaborators at IMPI to develop and design and share data and methodologies that would allow us to track deforestation over time. Um, I want to spend more of my time today talking about the future than the past, but I'd like to start here. And this is a really important place, I think. Um, this curve has been shown once today um, and represents a really Herculean effort. Because of the kinds of things you can do today in terms of accessing and processing satellite data, the smartphone in your pocket is much more powerful than any of the computers that were brought to bear on this problem for decades. And INPI and Brazil and, and as a country has really focused in on the opportunity saw this opportunity long before anybody else 
the idea that there were armies of people taking printed Landsat satellite images and hand mapping the extent of deforestation to calculate the extent and the location of changes across the Amazon basin um, was revolutionary, and it still is. It took 20 more or more years for the rest of the world to catch up for activities like Red Plus or reducing emissions from deforestation and degradation to advocate the use of the satellite remote sensing approaches that EMPI had pioneered 20 years before to capture the extent of tropical forest loss. And I'll be honest, the US still doesn't use our own data to make an annual estimate of forest loss across the entire US. So this is revolutionary, and I think it's, it's revolutionary in the way we understand the dynamics and changes, the way we look across decades or even individual years and in economic policies and their indirect or direct consequences. Um, but fundamentally, it's the idea that we can have access to a long time series of satellite data. We, we can go back in time, not just in Brazil, but in other places, and track the changes that have happened since 1984. And that's all facilitated by the long time series of satellite data that the US government and NASA and USGS have curated. Um, so I, I feel like that's really critical. I also want to point out, of course, that we're 75% down on annual deforestation rates from that peak in 2004. It's a remarkable accomplishment. And it reflects not just this effort, which has been well recognized in Brazil for a long time, but the subsequent work that allowed us to take not just this annual mapping approach, but the daily observations from NASA satellites to identify, track, and then in many cases, um, be able to send crews for environmental enforcement into the field to halt activities while they were ongoing. And so that advance, that sort of shift from mapping into monitoring, um, is a part of this story. It's not the only reason that deforestation declined, but it's a critical tool in terms of how deforestation, with the political will behind it in Brazil, was leveraging satellite data to make a change. So some of those newer systems are still going and have been improved over time. The original system called DETER that I participated in in the early part of the 2000s has now shifted to use better, higher quality satellite data at finer spatial resolution. So we're not looking at clearings um, on the order of 25 or 50 hectares. Now we're down to looking at clearings as they begin at the scale of a half a hectare or one hectare, um, which is much more important if your goal is really to halt the process of deforestation um, while it's ongoing. So these new advances have allowed us to take a look not just at deforestation dynamics and how they've changed on a month-to-month -month or even week-to-week -week basis. Um, projects like Deter Bay now actually take on the challenge of trying to identify areas that are subjected to forced degradation processes, fire and logging as a major component of the total impact of human activity at the forest frontier. The, the democratization of the process has also been really important. So NGOs like Amazon and their system, which is, again, built on the same available satellite data that you and I can access, um, allows the NGO world and the government uh, to work in partnership around understanding the change dynamics. And their emphasis on transparency helped to advance the implementation of the DETER project and the use of those data to help con counter illegal deforestation this project is still ongoing and has continued to be advanced by, the, uh, by this NGO and, and by others. Um, my colleague Matt Hansen down the road at the University of Maryland took that one step further and didn't just do this now for Brazil, but is now doing annual estimates of forest loss worldwide. So this is a project that's built on the backs of freely available Landsat data and processed through a partnership between Google and the University of Maryland that now looks at the total dynamics of forest loss and forest gain uh, on an annual basis, which is remarkable. Um, I, will, I will make very few caveats here other than to say that I'm excited to see that people have taken this to its logical endpoint, although there's more that we can do. Um, the fact is that these data and the approaches that have been developed by the scientific community can be routinely applied for looking at Brazil or any other country. The devil is always in the details. Because forest loss is not strictly deforestation. In this case, the estimates for Brazil for forest loss reflect all of the processes that might be responsible for changing forests, including those areas that are degraded, areas that are even disturbed by natural processes, or the dieback of bamboo. Um, so those are all the pieces that are collected in this estimate, but it's a great place to start the conversation. And the fact that this is an open, accessible, uh, routinely updated, um, again, represents another counterpoint to the 
hard work that's done at INPI for an annual estimate and the important role that civil society plays in terms of guiding our discussion about forest loss. This is a paper that came out last week that tries to then take the estimates of forest loss identified by the Maryland group across the world and categorize them in terms of what are the driving factors. So this comes back again to why. Why is forest being lost in these different regions? You'll see that the brightest red, even from the back of the room, lights up the Amazon arc of deforestation because those are areas where commercial agriculture, either ranching or row crop agriculture, are consistent with the kinds of expansion we see in other places like Indonesia for oil palm production. Very few areas across Africa show that same pattern of large-scale intensive clearing for mechanized agriculture. Um, much of the rest of the world lights up as green for forestry um, or the darker shades for, um, for fires in the high northern latitudes. But this is really critically important context, not only because we need to understand what's happening in the Amazon, but we need to understand where the Amazon fits into the global picture. So when this group started looking not just at Brazil but across the rest of the world, and importantly, this is not just the Amazon, this is all of Brazil, including forest loss in the Sahad, forest loss in the Mata Atlantica, um, and other regions that are, um, have sometimes been overlooked by national activities inside of Brazil. Brazil was more than 50% of the global forest loss in the early part of this time series, and now represents only a third. Obviously, there's more that could be done to continue to thwart illegal deforestation or forest clearing, which is... Um, outside of the Amazon, but contributing to Brazil's carbon footprint and to the overall land use changes. Um, one of the things I will mention, and this is uh, where some of the friction or the opportunity lies, is that not all of these estimates agree. And there's some obvious reasons for that. If I take a satellite image that's cloudy one day, and you take the satellite image that's not cloudy the next day, we'll be looking at different places. And so we might not be able to make the same maps of daily or weekly or monthly um, deforestation just because of the data sets that we're working with. Uh, but it also represents a more fundamental problem, which is how do we deal with this gradient of disturbance between full, outright mechanized clearing for soybean production with large tractors and an incredible amount of capital and labor investment, um, all the way back to small-scale efforts for either clearing or unintentional aspects of the human activity, including forest fires. And we haven't dealt with these the same way over time. So that puts us in a little bit of a bind. The opportunity is there to right past wrongs, um, but it's difficult politically to think about returning to the 80s and to the 90s and to the early 2000s, uh, time periods which have not only been um, heavily discussed, but have also been negotiated in terms of the baseline periods that might be appropriate for programs like Red Plus, um, to revisit those time periods and point out the fact that there were some efforts that potentially included degradation in our estimates of deforestation. Um, these are political hot button issues. I think there's good scientific justification for returning to those periods because we need to understand more about the climate sensitivity of land use and its changes, as Paul already pointed out. Um, I think it's also critical that we get the, the right answer for the right reasons. Um, and so this is one example showing some of the diversity of estimates of deforestation across the Amazon region from different groups, again, potentially even using the same data, arriving at some slightly different patterns there in those different lines. So. I'm going to kind of cap off the deforestation part here and just try to hit a couple of highlights. Um, to me, the availability of satellite data has really spurred an incredible amount of innovation and in that that's collective. It's not just at the hands of a few, but this is a democratized process where satellite information is carried forward and analyzed by NGOs, by researchers, by government agencies, um, and that that allows us to do some pretty impressive things. I've talked a little bit about the PROTUS program and its follow-on systems for monitoring of deforestation. I didn't yet bring up the, the property registration system, the CAR, which is another watershed event in the development and in the opportunity for Brazil to lead the way, where satellite imagery are used to allow property owners to geo-register their property boundaries, their areas of use as required by law, and their areas of set-aside for legal reserves and areas of permit preservation. All of that is done on the backs of available satellite data. It's almost remarkable to imagine that 5 million private properties could be geo-registered with property boundaries and areas of use, areas of set-aside, et cetera. Um, it's really not possible without the availability of satellite data. There's also a side of this, which is that specific activities have been targeted in the past, and some of our work contributed to the development and implementation of the soy moratorium, where new deforestation, specifically for producing soybeans, was... Um, was the source of some controversy in the supply chains for soy consumers, particularly in Europe. 
And so companies agreed to not purchase soybeans from areas of recent deforestation. And that really depended on our ability to identify which areas were newly cleared and which areas ended up in soybeans. And to do that across an area as large as the Amazon required satellite data. Um, I talked a little bit about the disagreement on some of these products, and I'll go into more of the reasons why that might be happening in terms of forest degradation. And I think this is really an opportune moment, I think, in activities within Brazil to help expand some of the use of satellite data to monitor other biomes are very encouraging. Um, I think that they have lagged at times in the past and certainly today are, are suffering under the lack of funding. Um, and I think to come back to the Earth System Science perspective, which is where NASA begins this discussion, um, we have information in terms of our understanding of the likely vulnerability of Amazon forests under drought or flood conditions. And we have satellite observations as well as ground measurements that help us anticipate some of those coming events. And so we're more poised than ever to be more proactively managing, especially in human-dominated landscapes. And I think that's something we could carry over in the discussion today. The idea that satellite data allow us, uh, and our Earth system understanding, give us the foundation we would need to be able to proactively manage and protect natural vegetation in areas of human land use. And I'll end my talk today with one specific example there. So, I want to move into this, dis this discussion of forest degradation, and I want to start with what has become kind of a classical paradigm, the forest transition theory, which is that we start with a largely intact ecosystem like the Amazon, and over time we move from a transition where frontier clearing supports small scale and small, uh, low capitalized uh, land uses, and we shift then into a, per a period where more intensive and more concentrated land use um, allows us to protect some smaller areas of those natural areas of vegetation, and we end up in this place that may look more like a model of your uh, U.S. or European endpoint with parks and cities and farmland. Um, and that's certainly one model, but this model is, is pretty incomplete in my mind. And there are two things that are missing here. And the first is that it looks like it's a one-way trip from natural ecosystems to highly urbanized and highly mechanized agricultural production, and it's definitely not. Right? Even over the last 20 or 30 years, we've seen large-scale land abandonment of agriculture in Russia. We've seen the same across parts of Central America and the Caribbean. Those are moving backwards on this curve. And I don't think that's backwards. I just think it's a different way to look at this transition. So you see many areas across where agriculture has been, uh, large-scale uh, large abandonment has occurred, um, moving back to landscapes that have more regeneration and have more, uh, more vegetation in those areas, whether they're natural or whether there's some combination of natural and non-natural invasives is an open question. Um, the other part, of course, that's missing is there's no wedge on here for forest degradation. Right? There's no additional piece that says, hey, our impacts from agriculture kind of extend beyond the limits of the areas we've cleared for production. Um, and that's what I've tried to highlight here, that light green wedge, which we know goes hand in hand with other developments in the frontier in the, in the Amazon region. Um, and so what I'd like to show you today are a couple of examples. One is how we use that same long time series of satellite observations to estimate what the cumulative impact from human activity is at the frontier. And the other is to take some of our newer technology, uh, airborne laser mapping technology, to try to understand what the characteristics are of those forests that have been degraded recently and those have been degraded over the last 15 or 20 years. So I'm going to zero in on a, a zone uh, in the central part of Mato Grosso State. This is Feliz Natal and Nova Ubirata, two municipalities that have seen more rapid expansion of soybean agriculture. Um, and this is a picture from just a couple of years ago, a combination of Landsat images to show you the extent in green of forested areas. But if we walk back through time, and here I'm showing the extent of logging in yellow, of deforestation in blue, and of fire in orange and red, you'll see that much of this landscape was logged by the mid-1990s. Those are areas that are still remain in forest, but have been logged. And in the late 1990s and early 2000s, fire moved into this area in ways that hadn't been seen before in the Landsat record. So we don't have evidence of large-scale burning, even inside of the Xingu, which is an area where indigenous land uses along the, the main course of the Xingu Basin allows you to get large-scale fires even in areas of intact forest, protected area by the standards that most would use for describing some of the indigenous lands. Um, this is the landscape today. The green areas have not been observed as logged or burned. All the colors outside of blue are degraded forests that persist on the landscape. So if we just zero in on the municipality of Feliz Natal, you can draw, without me even pointing to it, the, the division between the indigenous reserve and the remainder of the municipality. 
You can also see that the vast extent of forests in this municipality have been degraded by logging, by fire, or by both logging and fire over the last 35 years. So if I were to go back to that forest transition model again and start to lay out these wedges, uh, the green wedge clearly disappears. Um, the black wedge here in this case is the amount of deforestation, which is still far below the 20% limit by the forest code. But there's 40% of the forests that remain that have been degraded by logging or by fire. And there's no stipulation in the forest code or other Brazilian legislation that necessitates a lack of degradation on lands that are managed or even areas that have set aside and preserved. So I think that's where I'd like to, to zero in now. What are the characteristics of these landscapes? Um, this region has widespread effects of human activity in terms of logging and fire that persist in the landscape. How do those contribute to our understanding of the Amazon as a whole? And where are there opportunities for us to consider um, more careful management in private lands that would help eliminate the problems like this? These are large forest fires that burned over the course of months inside of the Shingu Basin, where each one of those rings shows you the daily progression of the fire. The fire is more intense during the day and it kills more trees. The fire is less intense at night and it kills fewer trees. And you can literally count the rings here and figure out that these fires burned for 30 or 40 days. This wasn't a like, oh my gosh, it happened yesterday and there was nothing we could do about it. Um, these are areas which, under the auspices of some of the existing capabilities, from satellite remote sensing, from firefighting and brigades, and from our motivation in terms of managing and protecting protected areas, um, offer us an opportunity that hasn't yet been realized. I'll just take one dive into the Red Plus world for just a second, which essentially is to say Brazil, as I've mentioned, has been a leader on mapping deforestation and estimating carbon emissions from deforestation. But no one to date has reported the emissions that come from forest degradation as a part of their international commitments to reducing emissions on deforestation and degradation. And part of this because it's a difficult process. Not only is logging different in Indonesia than it is in the Amazon, but those forests remain as forests. And so if you wait long enough, they will recover their full amount of carbon stocks. The question is, how long do you have to wait? And how much did you take a penalty for those in international negotiations in the meantime? So that's what we set out to do using um, some airborne laser data. So we fly about 325 meters above the uh, forest. We don't hit the Atto Tower. Um, and we fly with a laser system that fires 300,000 laser pulses per second. And that allows us to take a measurement of the range to the top of canopy, to the middle of the canopy, and down to the ground to estimate the height and the structure and the complexity of forests like this area outside of Santarém. These data are incredibly valuable because they're capturing the three-dimensional structure of tropical forests. That is a measurement that is incredibly uh, important if we're trying to estimate the total amount of biomass as well as the amount of biodiversity that might be in forests like this one. We can't do this from space yet. We're launching new LIDAR missions from space to capture aspects of the structure of forests, but nothing that will help us resolve individual trees that I'm showing you here. So these LIDAR data really represent an important advance. Um, our group has been uh, part of the, the major effort in developing the capacity to collect and analyze LIDAR data in Brazil. Um, all of our data are online, including our field plots that we've put in for calibrating our estimates of how those individual trees add up to a forest stand and then store a number, uh, store a certain amount of carbon. Um, this model is something that then was ported over to the group at INPI with a, a data set that I'll show you later, a very exciting large area sample using the same airborne LIDAR technology but across a larger region of the Amazon. Um, this is what I wanted to come back to. So our group has been focusing in on the forest frontier and collecting LIDAR information right at that forest edge where areas have experienced logging or have experienced fires. I showed you some of the spatial patterns that you might see in the satellite data, and that's what's the grayscale here. Um, over the top of that, what I'm showing you is a uh, five kilometer by 200 meter stretch of LIDAR data where we've used the LIDAR information to estimate the height, the structure, and the total amount of carbon that's contained in those forests. And you can see alongside those striping patterns, the gradual reduction from intact forests to much lower carbon stocks as we move from areas that have been burned once, twice, or three times. And so what we've been able to finally do is be able to put a number on what the carbon losses are associated with areas that have burned or been logged recently, areas that have been burned or logged five or 10 or even 15 years ago. And this is the table that I think gives us a gateway in terms of trying to estimate how degradation in places like the Amazon 
contributes to the total carbon emissions that are released from human activity. And the numbers here are large. Um, so in this case, we're saying that areas that have been logged in our estimates have only about 55% of intact forest carbon stocks the first year after logging. But that recovers reasonably quickly. So where after 15 years, you might see about 80 or 82% of the original forest carbon stocks there. In the case of burning, the story is much different, where we might lose between a half and two thirds of the carbon from just a single fire. And that recovery process is much slower, in part because you've killed many, if not all, of the tall canopy trees, and you're getting a reflush of vegetation low to the ground, which itself is more likely to burn again, but over time, takes much longer to develop than the residual forest that's left after individual trees were removed for selective logging. These numbers are, are large. They also, of course, depend on how extensive the amount of log forest or burn forest is in any given year. We've just come through a very strong El Nino period with extensive fires that were reported across the main stem of the Amazon up into Horaima, and then, as you would expect, the subsequent dry season in the southern Amazon. This is the region around Santarén where more than a million hectares burned in 2015 and into 2016. These fires burned for months. And in total, if we use those LIDAR data that I showed you before, and we use our estimates that we can take from mapping those areas of forest damage from our satellite data, we'd estimate that in a year like 2015 or 2016, the committed carbon flux, the amount of forest biomass that was killed by those fires across the Amazon, was between two and three times the amount lost from direct deforestation. Now, thankfully for the Amazon, not every year is an El Nino year. But in terms of our understanding and in terms of going forward, um, part of this whole process, including the LBA effort, started on the backs of the 97-98 El Nino, which put fires in the Amazon on the map. We've just come through the 2015-2016 El Nino with largely similar consequences. So it's been a tough look in the mirror for scientists like me and others that are involved in trying to improve our responsiveness. Can we anticipate the locations where fire is highest risk? Can we identify those fires as they're burning? And can we facilitate the kinds of systems that would be needed to put them out and avoid the damages that we're seeing in years like 2015 and 2016? Um, that effort's ongoing. Um, I mentioned earlier that there's been a large effort. This is an INPI study using support from Funda Amazonia to collect the same kinds of airborne LIDAR data I showed you before, but not just over those frontier forests, now distributed across all of uh, Amazon forest types. Um, and this is a project that's ongoing. It's really exciting, and I think we'll see some of the results from this by the end of the year. Um, a massive implementation of the airborne satellite or remote sensing technology that I described before um, to understand the characteristics of natural ecosystems and to understand their changes over time. I think one of the things that we're learning as we start to collapse the long time series of information we get from satellite remote sensing is that the imprint, the footprint of human activity is larger than we've previously recognized, and that the legacy of that activity is, is long lasting and important, whether we're talking about carbon or biodiversity uh, or land value, because areas that have been logged have lost areas of, um, uh, of lost valuable trees that wouldn't be logged again for, um, for some time. The, um, the important story here, I think, is that the, the damages from fire that we're able to identify and record with airborne LIDAR data are much more significant than the damages we're seeing from selective logging. And so in terms of reducing the carbon footprint, not just because those fires are unintentional and damaging, but also because they have a long-lasting impact on the structure and carbon stocks in Amazon forests, fire is an important target for our further work using remote sensing data and using the capacity that exists in Brazil and on the ground to prevent those kinds of forest fires again. I want to end on a, a slightly different note, um, picking up again on this theme of fire, um, because fire is one of the things that's most easily captured, uh, it's one of the data sets that's most widely shared from NASA satellites. If you're a manager in a park in South Africa, you can get a text message within 30 minutes of a satellite overpass telling you there's a fire in your park and the location of that activity. Um, it's been one of the hallmark uses of satellite data for rapid response to disasters in this country and abroad. Um, and fire is something that's radically changing. Uh, and it's changing in important ways in terms of protecting and preserving tropical forests. It's changing in complicated ways in terms of protecting and preserving savanna landscapes. So the map on the top shows you the distribution of global burned area. And if fire is not a day-to-day -day reality for you, you live in one of those blue zones. Um, fire is a day-to-day -day reality for a lot of people uh, across the planet. And most of the burning happens in savanna ecosystems. 
the bottom map actually shows you how much fires have changed over the last 20 years. And all those areas of blue, including the Amazon arc of deforestation, light up as a region that have less fire today than they did 20 years ago. And we can look to some of those landscapes and think that's a, an important success as we're moving towards uh, understanding the human impact uh, in places like the Amazon where, yes, 100% of the fires are human caused. You can also see some landscapes, including the regions of the Cejado and Mato Piba, that light up as areas with increasing fire activity. Um, and this is, again, coming back to some of those same concepts of the forest transition theory, uh, an avenue that makes perfect sense. Fire is the cheapest and most effective land management tool when you've got nothing else you can use. Um, as you move across that economic development spectrum and you have access to resources, capital, machinery, um, you'd rather not take the risk of lighting everything on fire if you could avoid it. And that's the kind of pattern we're seeing playing out in the Amazon. That's the kind of pattern we're seeing playing out across other landscapes, including Africa. Of course, as settled land uses move in, you're also fragmenting that habitat and making large fires more difficult because there are patches they would have to burn across that have no fuel. There are a number of different drivers for this, but they're all in, in many ways predictable. Um, the image here is a Landsat picture from the western side of Bahia, which has experienced pretty rapid growth of uh, mechanized agriculture in the last five to ten years. And the last remaining places to burn are those areas that are set-asides for uh, natural vegetation as required by law or not usable in terms of agriculture. And that's a pattern that's been played over and over again. Um, but it's one that I want to come back to before I finish. Um, We've seen a number of different trends in terms of intensification. We've seen massive population growth. These dots represent the 24 countries with the most burned area. Brazil is the blue dot, which this is not an eye test. It's on the bottom of the lower panel on the left. Um, most population growth has been urban, not rural. So some of our usual predictors in understanding the patterns of land use change and the influence of human activity have been in terms of population numbers. We've got to separate that out, because our urban population and our rural populations have different imprints on the landscape. We've also seen across every large per country with cattle production an intensification. And in some of these landscapes now, we're literally grazing the fuel and it can't burn. So fire is decreasing because there's nothing left to burn. And that's important as we talk about the avenues for improving the, mass the management of pasture lands, improving intensification. Um, it has an impact on natural landscapes. And that's something we haven't potentially considered as much. Um, I know this isn't the Amazon, but what happens in the Sahado directly affects what happens in the Amazon. Um, it, through the benefits of the programs like CAR, which have mapped large properties across this landscape, we now know that more than 50% of the protected vegetation in the Sahado is on private lands. So large protected areas and indigenous reserves account for a little less than 50%. And large private properties with their set aside holdings and reserves, legal reserves, account for more than 50% of the protected vegetation in the Sahado. The catch is that the private lands aren't burning. So we have protected vegetation under the auspices of a very powerful law, the Forest Code, which has required not just the identification, but the protection of those reserve areas. But there's nothing in the Forest Code about management. And the set aside and leave it alone policy may be perfect in the Amazon, but it's not so perfect in terms of protecting savannas. What happens in the savannah if you don't burn is it turns into a woodland and ultimately into a forest, which is still protected vegetation and may have many of the natural characteristics of Sahanda vegetation, but it's not the landform that was originally protected, an open grassland or an open uh, Sahanda form. And that's what I'm trying to get at here. The areas that are outlined in the hatch marks are those protected areas and indigenous reserves and prote um, protected landscapes for conservation. And those are the ones that are burning every year. So we have this very distinct difference in terms of the way fire is used in either indigenous communities or protected areas and the way it's used on, pr on private lands. Um, and it's the same conversation. How are we going to protect and manage ecosystems in human dominated landscapes? We want to have that conversation in the Amazon. We want to have that conversation in the Sahado. And satellite data offers one vehicle for understanding what the patterns of use have been and how we might use that as a way to guide our discussions about where we want to take this in the future. Um, I'll close with one last example. I'm sorry if I'm going long here, um, which comes back to some of the questions on tipping point. And I wanted to include this because this is a really critical piece. Um, we have models that have examined the future trajectories of climate change in the Amazon. And we have models that have, ex have estimated what kinds of future land use change might occur under different policy scenarios. 
And we can put the two of those together and look at the way in which human activity and its distribution across the Amazon in combination with climate change might predispose the region to more or less fire. In this case, I'm not talking about all fires or fires for agriculture management. I'm just talking about fires that are burning standing tropical forests. And the message here is that if you were to take uh, today's land use and put it in the context of climate at the end of the century under one of the more, um, sadly, not extreme climate scenarios, the kind of climate scenario we're on in terms of fossil fuel usage, you get a dramatic increase of 40, uh, 26 percent, no, sorry, five times as much burning across the Amazon. If you take and expand land use and expand climate change, you obviously have a much bigger impact, but just protecting against future land use doesn't save you. So um, I think that's one of the critical messages here. This entire landscape is exposed, as Paula said, to greater climate extremes and to an overall shift towards uh, more flammable conditions. And human activity under those more flammable conditions leads to more burning. And counterintuitively and somewhat frustratingly, if we protect more forests, there's more forest to burn. And that's one of the reasons why in these model scenarios you actually get more burning when you protect more areas of the landscape from further agricultural development. And that's kind of the challenge we face going forward. Um, just really quickly then, um, on the fire side of things, uh, we're seeing about 25% less burning worldwide today than we did 20 years ago. Most of that's happening across savanna landscapes, and that's a challenge for conservation, and I pointed specifically to the way in which that's a challenge for conservation in the Sahado. Um, we have the kind of our system understanding I think we need to advance our work in predictive capabilities. Um, part of that prediction and prevention um, go hand in hand, and maybe that's something that um, we'll hear about later. Uh, and I really wanted to end on a question here, which is to say that the forest code and the way in which it leverages the available satellite data and the long record and expertise in Brazil is a really remarkable um, avenue. Um, and is that the right vehicle for then working towards a more responsible management of protected landscapes on private properties um, or not? Because uh, in one case, we need to have further efforts to protect Amazon forests from burning. And on the other hand, we might need to advance an approach that would allow for greater use of fire as a management tool for natural vegetation and other biomes. Um, and that's a challenging policy to implement, but I think that's going to be critical for understanding and sustaining those landscapes over time. Thank you. Questions? Uh, how are the budgets keeping up for the remote sensing and LIDAR and the analysis of the data as well as the collection, both in the U.S. and Brazil? Um, it's a good question. I think uh, right now we, we have a new administrator who was just brought on board several months back, um, and he's been uh, a champion for Earth science missions in ways we maybe didn't originally anticipate. Um, I think the budget process is the budget process, and I don't know that we'll have a lot of clarity on that for a couple more months. Um, the reality is we're in the process of launching new satellite missions, um, one that launched last week, one that will launch in November that are specifically designed to capture the three-dimensional structure of forested landscapes like the Amazon. Um, and those are going forward full steam ahead. Um, I think the funding side on, on Brazil is something I would let others respond to, um, other than to say that um, the, the follow-on for the LBA program was an LBA phase two program, which has had uh, some important successes in maintaining these lines of research in Brazil. Um, I'd love to see that continued uh, and continue to keep this cohort of activities that began 20 years ago um, that's expanded in many regions, as Paulo talked about, uh, continue to grow, especially in the land use sector. Yes. Thanks, that was great. Um, so recent analyses indicate that small patch deforestation is increasing whereas the extensive commodity driven is still stable or decreasing. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that the f deforestation estimates provided by PRODIS are increasingly inaccurate? And if so, what metrics should we be adapting our analyses of total deforestation in the Amazon? Um, it's a great question. I think the, um, I think the reality is that there's, a, there's been some adaptation uh, and there's been some changing economic circumstances. One of the things that I found uh, striking um, going into the Amazon 20 years ago was seeing uh, Landsat maps on the wall of the large ranches that I would visit in Mato Grosso. 
So 20 years ago, there was some understanding of the value of having satellite data and also some understanding about the time of overpass of those satellites in terms of management and influencing their uh, probability of detection. And so this game goes both ways. So improving our use of satellite data for rapid detection has also improved the understanding of when and where uh, those activities might be most effective in terms of advancing illegal activities when satellites have less uh, attention to those details. Um, the small-scale deforestation, therefore, is a reflection of the fact that you have both large farmers taking small bites and small farmers taking small bites. Um, I'm pretty confident that the PROTUS program can capture that level of detail. Um, if it's a question of returning to some of the older data and making sure we're being consistent over time, um, that's the kind of thing I guess I'm advocating for in general, not just because of the shift towards more small clearings, but also to make sure we've carefully kept track of the areas that were, uh, that were marked as cleared, but were actually only burned or logged. And so we're able to correct and understand the current context relative to the historic time record. Uh, could you describe the role of El Nino in those fires in, that you talked about? Is it a fuel condition thing because all the ignitions are human, or what's the mechanism there? I don't have my wheel diagram. There's a couple of papers we put together on this process because we've been trying to better understand this, um, not just in the Amazon, but actually globally in terms of the way in which the change in rainfall distribution during El Nino um, or lagged effects from areas that are subject to fires essentially caused by El Nino change across the Amazon. Um, in the case of the central Amazon, the fires I showed near Santareng, um, that's because there's a dramatic shift in rainfall during the end of the dry season, and the rainy season comes late. So essentially, you get a more intense dry season, and in this case, rains were delayed by more than a month in the region around Santareng. So the river level dropped to some of its lowest levels um, in the Tapajos, and that area um, was subjected to conditions that typically occur across more southern regions of the Amazon. The Amazon's got plenty of fuel to burn. It just rarely has the climbing conditions that it needs to burn. And what I mean by climate conditions isn't that it's hot and dry for a day or two. What allows these fires to grow large, like the ones I showed you in those uh, satellite images, is you need to have climate conditions where you have warm nights. So we focus a lot on the daytime temperatures because that's our sensible kind of measurement of the influence of weather or climate. Um, but what allows these fires to grow large essentially is the fact that you have very low relative humidity at night. You don't get dew, and so you don't allow the fires to naturally go out at night in the way that they would under other climate conditions. And that's what allows fires to burn for weeks or months. So just to come back to that for a second, though, I mean, when we combine the measurements we can take from our satellites that Paula mentioned that are actually weighing water from space, we can see the imprint of a coming drought. Right? We should be able to then link that up with our understanding of the fact that those regions will be experiencing drier conditions. And we have the routine detections of active fires or areas of forest damage that we should be able to put in in together in, in telling that story. And that's part of the pieces we've been trying to connect. And I know that Semadang has been working actively on that as well. And so um, I think we're, 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 we're moving towards that landscape where our Ursithum understanding will allow us to be more responsive to pending natural disasters. Um, that's my vision anyway. You one more of that. Do you want to ask your regrowth question? Okay. I didn't answer your regrowth question either. Thank you very much. I actually have three questions. If you don't mind, you can answer any of those. Uh, the LIDAR, the airborne LIDAR work is really tremendously exciting because degradation is such a huge problem all over, and we haven't been able to address it with remote sensing data. And I wonder just about what the scale of the expansion of that program is to other parts of the world, and can we use that elsewhere, and when the data may be available? Um, the second question has to do with uh, just the fires that are burning and the, the response you just gave about the small farmers versus the large farmers versus the corporates. And I'm wondering if there's good evidence of changes after the soy moratorium. Is there a good way to link what happened when the moratorium occurred and what, ha what has happened with uh, fires or deforestation since then, uh, whether there's good work to make those causal linkages, whether it exists or not. And then I, I forget the third question. We'll stop there. No, well, that's the natural region. <laughs> Let me see if I can quickly answer those three, and then we can move on. Or maybe you guys grab some coffee. Um, so the airborne lighter day that I mentioned are, are available through our partners at Embrapa, 
Um, and that data has been available online in particular because it's a valuable resource that are some, it's sometimes expensive to acquire. Um, I believe all the data that EMP is collecting across the Amazon will also be made publicly available using a very similar portal to the one we developed. Um, at NASA, I have, we have our own airborne package that we fly. Um, we're typically restricted to flying over U.S. territories, but we've collected data from Alaska down to Puerto Rico and then the southern extent of Mexico. We're not allowed to fly our equipment in Brazil. We won't go there. Um, uh, and all those data are also freely available online. And so I think globally, the access to LiDAR data is increasing. Uh, and that's encouraging because um, not only are we interested in understanding the current state, we'd like to come back and revisit those same areas and understand the three-dimensional changes that have gone on before. So we have some recent work that shows there was a 60% increase in tree mortality from the El Nino for forests that didn't burn. And you know, it's not very dramatic to show on screen because it's an increase from, say, 2% to 3% or 3.2%. 3 um, but that's a major impact when you talk about the extent of Amazon forests and those that were subjected to drought conditions during the El Nino. On the regrowth side, I'm a little bit more pessimistic. Uh, in active land use frontiers across the Amazon, there's very little secondary forest from land abandonment. Um, and this is where it comes back to definition. So it's really critical that we're able to track the history of those forests so we're not calling burn forests regrowth. They are, in fact, regrowing following degradation, but they're not regrowing following an active process by which someone said, I'm moving on, forget the coffee, um, I'm going to do something else and abandon this landscape. Um, the land tenure uh, is actually remarkably stable, despite the long-standing myth that land use in the Amazon can only be sustained for several years and then must be abandoned. Uh, most of these areas have been continuously used for agriculture for decades. Um, so as we look at active frontiers, like the one I showed you in central Mato Grosso, we see very little. When I say little, I mean like less than half a percent of the landscape is in secondary forest. So um, again, and that's our definition because we're separating out logging and fire from areas that are abandoned and recover long term into second growth forest. Um, there are other portions of the landscape and other areas that may have a higher percentage. Um, but overall, um, our experience has been there's very small and very fleeting amounts of second growth forest because those areas have incentive to be recleared and reutilized. I forgot your third question, but I'll answer it at coffee. Thank you very much.